Hello, this is Rainer Koschnik from Germany, and I love alternative comics. This episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by Patreon supporters like me. Enjoy the show. This is the Comics Alternative, episode 184, reviews of 5,000 kilometers per second, Circuit Breaker, numbers 1 and 2, and Department H, number 1. And welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen, and we're two people with PhDs talking about comics. And on this week's review episode, Gwen and I are going to look at three fascinating titles. We're going to begin with 5,000 Kilometers Per Second by Manuel Fiore. After that, we're going to look at issues number one and two of Circuit Breaker, written by Kevin McCarthy with art by Kyle Baker. And then we're going to finalize things with Matt Kent's new comic, Department H, uh, one that he does with his wife, Charlene. But before we get into that fun discussion, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, including April, you will find some unbelievable specials. Now, sometimes those specials will be at 45% off the cover price. Sometimes you'll find them at 50% off cover, but often you will find discounts that go higher from there. Absolutely, and Derek, this month, Discount Comic Book Service has issues of depth, or Department H, um, for $2.39, which is 40% off. Um, they have the all of the issues um, up to now of Circuit Breaker, including number two, which debuts this week, for $1.79, which is 40% off. And they have the beautiful um, European graphic novel, 500 kilometers per second, at $14.94, which is 35 cents, uh, 35% off the cover, <laughs> not 35 cents. And that's really a wonderful savings, especially because... This is one of those traditional and very beautiful European comics, so it's it's really a work of art. So being able to get that for under $15 is really great. That's right. Well, you know, you can always expect wonderful discounts on a variety of different books at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to the website and find out what other specials they have. That's dcbservice.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please send them an email and tell them that Gwen and Derek sent you. You know, Derek, it's usually we record in the afternoon, but it's pretty early this morning. I wonder if you started off the day with any warm liquid beverage. I did, and it was coffee, but not just any coffee, Gwen. What kind of coffee was it, Derek? <laughs> it was. <laughs> how apparent can we be? It was Just Coffee Co-op Coffee. It's a great place at Just Coffee Co-op to get your coffee, but also your tea and chocolates. All their coffee is 100% fair trade, it's shade grown, and it's organic certified. Everything is roasted in small batches. They do everything roasted to order. That's right, and JCC is a cooperative, and in addition to the worker-focused nature of the business, they're also really socially conscious. Um, um, they partner with On the Ground to raise money and awareness for sustainable community development in farming regions around the world. So, you know what? Where you need to go for this is http double black slash justcoffee.coop.coop. And after you've done your order, go ahead and um, type in the word comics and you will have um, 10% off. And you can tell them that the wonderful folks at um, our wonderful broadcast sent you. That's right. Yeah, comics coupon code will give you 10% off. And remember, shipping is always free. So go to justcoffee.coop, a great place to get caffeinated in a socially responsible manner. That's right. 
Well, Gwen, we have some very interesting books to discuss this week. Each is different from the other. Each stands out in its own unique way. So let's go ahead and get into that conversation. So the first book we're going to look at this week is 5,000 Kilometers Per Second. This is by Manuel Fiore, published by Fantagraphics. And, and Gwen, what are your initial thoughts of this text? Well, I think it's absolutely a beautiful text. It's one of those um, texts that, that moves you about in time. So you meet the characters at one point in their life, and then you see them at various other points in their life. And the continuity that comes together is really you, the reader, having to sort of make that happen, understand where each character is in his or her life. Um, and the ending has a beautiful twist. And so, you know, I really enjoyed it. It's it's very beautifully drawn. It reminds me a lot of actually the comics of Bastion Vives, who's a French comics creator and a contemporary of Manuel Fior, um, who also lives in Paris. I'd like to think they knew each other. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, it's really exciting, though, to get a hold of a European comic. Um, this actually originally came out in 2010. It won um, the grand prize in the 2020, 2010, easy for me to say, Angouim Comics Festival, the big you know, comics festival in France. So it's been quite a lauded book over there, but it's really exciting that Fantagraphics has made it available to us in English um, so that we can, you know, enjoy it, especially because it was originally in Italian. Um, I can read French pretty well, but Italian, I, I don't know. So it was great to be able to read this comic. What were your thoughts? Yeah, uh, very similar to yours. Uh, it, it, we should mention the translator on this work is Jamie Richards. Uh, and in fact, after Andy Kunkka and I reviewed Lucille uh, several weeks ago, mm. and the translator uh, Edward uh, Gavin got in touch with us, and you know he told us that we did a great job on the show. I just feel that from now on, I absolutely need to mention <laughs> translators of text because right. you know it, it, in many ways their work is invisible. Uh, but Jamie Richards, who is the translator on Five Thousand Kilometers Per Second, his work is definitely not invisible. We wanted to give him credit for the translation. Now you mentioned this being an award-winning comic. I, I think it won the 2011 uh, Angoulême Comics Festival Award for Best oh, okay. Album, but it. It won the 2010 Grand Prize at the Luca Comics Festival in oh. Italy. And Luca and Algolem, oh, I think, are their two biggest uh, comics festivals in the world, uh, or two of the three biggest in the world. So, I mean, this is quite impressive. And if I'm not mistaken, is this uh, Fior's debut work, or has he done other things? No, he's done other things, and you're going to want me to tell you what those are, and I don't know. But when I look, I, I will tell you, he has a website. If you just type his name into the internet, he has a beautiful website. Actually, I got so wrapped up in looking at his illustrations that I didn't read the biography, but I did glance, and he has a number. <laughs> he has a number of uh, of titles. So, and I don't think that this was his first. Was this um, his first translated into English? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. And so, you know, we're, we, we are, you know, I, I hope we have more because he's a really sensitive writer. He uses dialogue economically, but when he does, it's really important to the story. Um, it's just really a great story. And there's the transitions between the different periods. I guess we should actually stop and say this is a love story. Um, it's a story of, um, of two teenagers who meet when they're very young, and um, it follows them through through their lives, the decisions that they make, etc. And as we move through different phases of their lives, we really have to work at those transitions, understand where they are in relation to each other and to the other people in their lives. But it's relatively easy to do. And I would say that um, the dialogue is, is excellent. It's sparse, but it's it really does help to carry the story along. And there are some interesting transitions. Derek, I don't know about you, but there was one point when I was reading the comic and I thought that one of the characters was still pregnant, and she started drinking wine. And I'm like, wait, don't. <laughs> and it turns out that we had actually moved into a different phase in her life, and we find that out subsequently. 
So right. there's some really nice transition work, and there's just enough challenge for you as a reader that, um, that you know, you get wrapped up in the story, but you can really figure out what's going on as you move through it. Exactly. And, um, you know, you had mentioned that this – uh, this narrative is all about time and the transitions that individuals make throughout their lives. You also mentioned that it starts with uh, these characters when they're young, and then we follow them into middle age. Mm -hmm. Not old age, but, but middle age. Um, when we Okay, this book is divided into five chapters and an introduction, and, and I really like it. It's very simple and straightforward, but I like it, I guess especially because of that, the way that Fjord divides or introduces his chapters. Instead of giving us chapter one with the number one, we get one raindrop falling down. Chapter two – two raindrops falling down, uh, because rain becomes a visual metaphor in, in many ways in this text. Uh, but we have an introduction and then five chapters. Now, in this introduction, we're introduced to the main characters, Lucia, Piero, and Nicola, and uh, they're from a, an Italian village. Uh, does it ever say where in Italy they're living? It may be a city, not a village. Yeah, I think it's actually a city, but okay. I can't remember which one. But I remember at one point um, there was a sign or something. That, okay. Yeah. And and Lucia has just recently moved to the neighborhood, and so Piero and Nicola are are watching her. And, of course, we, we've, we learn early on that Piero has something for her. He's attracted to her. Mm -hmm. And so in this introduction, we get the main characters, these three – uh, and especially Lucia and Piero, who meet for the first time. Then in Chapter 1, we transition into another location, Oslo, Norway. Uh, Lucia travels there to do work for her education, and uh, she ends up staying – with uh, a Norwegian family, uh, the mother Helga and Helga's son Sven. She, Lucia, finds herself a little taken by Sven. We also learn that her relationship with Piero, which had developed in that interim between the intro and chapter one, and in fact, much of the action of this narrative take, seems to take place between chapters where we never see, mm -hmm. right? right. Uh, so in that first chapter, Lucia in Oslo breaks things off with Piero, Piero and seems to be taken by Sven. That second chapter, we're taken to Piero uh, as he has become an adult, and whereas Lucia travels to Norway for her work, Piero travels to Egypt for his. He's an archaeologist, and we learn in this section that his relationship with Lucia is over with, but he's seeing someone named Cynthia. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that next chapter, the third, is Lucia, who is now married to Sven and is pregnant. And then that following chapter, Piero, back in Egypt, you know, again, time has passed. We discover that Cynthia is pregnant. And then that final fifth chapter, we're back in Italy with Lucia and Piero, and they meet. And it's approximately eight years after the events that occur in chapter four, when we first learn that Cynthia is pregnant. And, and the reason we know that it's around eight years is because Lucia at some point makes the comment to Piero when they meet again years later that her daughter is eight years old. Mm -hmm. So, right. so you know, all of this takes place over quite a broad temporal space, and as I mentioned, a lot of the events take place off-panel in between chapters. But I, I, I'll tell you, this is this is a thorough narrative, and it's one that is moving. Um, this book has everything that I really privilege in – and not just comics, but in almost any kind of narrative. Uh, it deals with relationships. It's not grandiose. It's not uh, you know in your face with action uh, a minute uh, with a lot of sound effects and, and, and whatnot. I mean I like this. Is There's something kind of calm about this, but at the same time, it's an underspoken drama. Yeah, and, you know, there's a couple of things that I would add to that. I agree with you entirely. And I think early in the chapters, you actually encounter two middle-aged women. 
um, Lucia's mother and Sven's mother. And their commentary on being middle-aged women actually resonated with me. But also, by the end of the text, Lucia, I think, has a new appreciation for some of the things that when she was a young girl, she heard these women saying, and probably it just went in one ear and out the other. By the time she, she herself is somewhat older, you get the, that's a really nice link through the comic. And I'll say one other thing really interesting. When I first opened up the comic, the comic is done in beautiful watercolors primarily. Oh, yeah. Um, and on page eight, there's a um, we, we get an uh, image of Lucia as she's being looked at by the two boys, right? She's up in her window in this home where she's just moved. And I don't know, Derek, but to me, this reminds me of either a Picasso portrait or um, even a little Chagall. Um, but, but really, the art is, is um, Fiore's own. And I, it's interesting, though, because I thought to myself at that moment, oh, this is going to be one of those texts that is primarily focalized through the male point of view. And we're, you know, we're going to look upon this woman as this, you know, perfect, pristine object. But actually, as you read through the text, not only does Lucia gradually, you know, come into her own in the comic, and her viewpoint is emphasized, but also this really ultimately is a text that 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 spends a lot of its time looking at women's lives and women's experiences. And so it's really a great, um, it's really a great comic for that. I think it's just, it, it deals with, with, you know, every possible phase of life that people go through and the, the complexity of the relationships. But again, like you said, in a really understated way. Yeah, you know, that, that's a good point that you made in bringing in these middle-aged female characters, Helga and then Lucia's mother, um, because they do – I hadn't thought of that before, but they do tell us something about a perspective that Lucia will not have until the end of this book, until the mm-hmm. end of the narrative. Uh, and, and, you know, if I had to – if if I had to say – where the primary focalization in this text is. Is it on Lucia or Pietro? I mean, I really would be hard-pressed, probably mm-hmm. Lucia, but we do get uh, you know, almost just as much perspective from Pietro. And I was thinking, as you were talking about the, the mothers, do we have a similar middle-aged character from a male's perspective that Pietro turns to? And I think we do later in the book, and that is the archaeologist he works with, the head guy, and that is Philip. Right. Uh, and we don't get him near as much as we get Helga and Lucia's mother in, in their words of wisdom. But in chapter four, when Pietro learns that Cynthia is pregnant, Philip more or less tells him that he's going to be replacing him with another archaeolo- uh, archaeological assistant and that this is for Pietro's benefit because he needs the importance of family right now. He needs mm-hmm. to go home and take care of things. Now, you know, whether Pietro feels the same way or not, we, I, I don't think we really have access to. But, but then that raises another question. I wanted to ask you about this, Gwen. Um, we do get perspectives from Lucia and Pietro. Do you ever feel, though, that we're inside the emotional world? In other words, we're understanding the experience that these two characters are going through. Because I have to tell you, there's, there's I think, a bit of a distance that Fior establishes in the story where we can see where both Lucia and Piero are coming from, what they're seeing, so to speak. But getting inside of them and finding out how they feel about something, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I completely tap in. Well, I did when Piero has a fever on the train and he he's hallucinating and, and going into a dream state and then back out of it again. That was one point in the comic where I really did feel that I had access to the character's inner life. But again, that wasn't something that was gained because of something that the character said or a way that a character behaved in the real world towards someone else. But those dream visions were a little bit useful in getting a sense for how he felt about his life choices at that point. But there is a bit of a distance, but I think that in in part adds to the mystery. I mean, I think one of the things that Fiore wants to point out is that life happens in a second. Sometimes a quick decision that we make has a huge impact on the rest of our lives and I think that in this text, we're really given the chance to figure that out slowly, <laughs> you know, rather than in some sort of, as you said, in your face way. I mean, it's, it's a, 
I mean, a decision that Lucia makes very early on in Norway has a huge impact on both her life and Piero's life. And I don't want to give too much away because obviously we'd love people to buy this comic and read it and enjoy it. But I will say that, that I think some of that distance maybe actually helps the narrative in a way. It forces you to work a little bit harder as a reader. Oh, I agree. I think that yeah. that distance is intentional, and I think that it works really well because we don't want to sympathize completely with these characters. And, and something that you just mentioned, that a decision that Lucia makes – uh, it's almost like a split-second decision has a profound impact. And this takes place in that first chapter uh, where she is in Oslo, and she first meets Helga and Sven, and so she's having dinner with the family. She gets a phone call from Piero, and it doesn't seem to be, um, let's say, a productive phone call. We can tell that there's some tension between the two in their relationship. Mm-hmm. And then Lucia makes – uh, a decision. She she's writing a letter later that evening to Piero, and we have access to what she writes, and it it's almost as if it is a split second decision where she decides that's enough, our mm-hmm. relationship is over, and and that's definitely not a spoiler because you know we said earlier that she ends up marrying Sven. and that split second decision has a profound impact on the story that follows, and this is an example of not really being able to see completely into a character's emotional state. I didn't feel that I knew exactly why Lucia made that decision that she did, but that's okay. Um, We see things a a bit from, emotionally speaking, from a little bit of a distance, and I think we're supposed to. Something similar goes on in this final chapter where we see Lucia, and, you know, like the other women that you had mentioned in this story, you know, she's middle-aged, she's gotten older, and she's unsure of herself. And, in fact, uh, when she has an encounter with Piero, she says, don't look at me. Don't look at me. And I can guess where she's coming from and what her state of mind is. But, again, we don't have complete access to what's going on. And we don't even know her relationship completely with someone who appears or, let's say, reappears at the very end of the narrative. And I don't want to give anything away here. Uh, but, but I appreciate that distance that Fiore has placed into his characters. Yeah. It's, and, and I think, too, that when a person's young, they often view their future sort of folding out ahead of them, and they don't always recognize that the decisions that they're making can have that kind of import, which is why I think it's interesting the next morning um, when Lucia is sitting out with Sven's mother, and they're looking over the fjords, and the mother is sort of ruminating on her life, her decisions, and you can see the way in which Lucia isn't entirely listening, but you almost wish you could go into the text and shake her a little bit, but, you know, I'm a middle-aged person talking about this text. Um, I think for a younger reader, maybe that's something they take away from it. It it would be, you know, it's sort of, it's very interesting comic and very contemplative, as you said. Um, I really enjoyed it. Me too. And, And we should mention that the book takes its title from an observation that Piero makes at one point when he's down in Egypt and he's talking, um, is it with uh, Cynthia from a distance or is? I yes, can't... it is. I think okay. it is. And he mentions that there is, yes, that's right. Yeah, he mentions right. that there is a one second lag, uh, but they're 5,000 miles fr- or kilometers from each other. So thus the title, 5,000 kilometers per second. Right. Uh, so and and I think that uh, the title also does suggest something that that you pointed out a while ago, and that is that the the things that happen in our lives sometimes are determined by events that happen or decisions that we make sometimes without thinking. You know, as you said, in a second. Right. Uh, I, I I absolutely love this book. I love the art. You mentioned the the watercolor style that Fiore uses. This is something that listeners definitely should check out. You know, even if you're not prone to picking up a, a European a comic or graphic album, if you want to call it that, uh, this is definitely something that could turn you on to a whole new world of comics. Absolutely. Well, 
Gwen, you want to get to the next title that we're going to be discussing this week? Yes, we're talking about Circuit Breakers. Um, this is um, written by Kevin McCarthy with art by Kyle Baker. It comes to us via Image Comics. Um, currently, volumes, or not volumes, issues one and two um, have been released. Or, and, yes. or mm-hmm. two is released this week. So right. um, Circuit Breaker is set in the aftermath of a terrible world war. And the entirety of humanity, as we know it, has um, basically become refugees moved to Japan, which is the only land mass that appears to have remained. And there's this very um, tense relationship between those refugees, people who are of Japanese ancestry, and robots. And these robots are, um, are were originally created to help mankind and indeed fought in the war um, uh, that uh, that had just happened. But now there's a great deal of tension because it's felt that these robots are taking people's jobs um, and maybe that they are, in fact, dangerous. And into this mix comes this young girl named Sharon who is a middle school student. She's a softball player um, of great talent, I might add. And it turns <laughs> out that some Some of that talent comes from the fact that she is herself, let me whisper this, a robot. Um, And (laughs) and she she finds herself in the middle of an escalating conflict between a a sort of very intense robot um, who believes that human beings should have to pay for being cruel to robots and her own inventor, who is trying to bridge um, sort of an accord between humans and robots. So I hope that does a pretty good job. It's a very Technicolor comic. Um, And I have to admit that I, I started to read it at night a couple days ago, which was a mistake because I was tired and I had trouble following it. But the next morning I woke up and I was able to read through one and two really quickly and really enjoyed it. So that's what this is. What did you think, Derek? Yeah, I think you did a great job of encapsulating the premise of Circuit Breaker. And I I enjoyed it. I agree with you, though, that this book, it's not complex, but the way that the story and especially Kyle Baker's visuals are laid out – there's a lot going on. It, it, it's a busy comic, but busy in a good way. And there's um, – um, again, you need, you need to really attend to what's going on. And when I say busy, I don't mean that there's just a lot of text that you have to read through. Uh, there is a bit of text, not too much, but there's also a lot of visual activity going on. There's a lot of action in this. And there's also a lot of sound effects, and this is one of the things that I found interesting about Circuit Breaker, uh, these first two issues, is that when something happens, when a robot is thrown through a window or a building comes tumbling down or someone is thrown against a wall, we have what – I guess in English what could be considered a sound effect, but even then, <laughs> they uh, they seem to come out of nowhere, and they're not the kind of sound effect that we would recommend. So, for instance, when we get into this first issue and sarin gas is being released on a subway, the I guess the sound of the gas being released, or maybe it's people coughing, is kahen. Uh, now, I guess that could be a cough if that's what's going on. Uh, on the same page that I'm looking at, when a robot is being thrown through the subway window, it's parin. Now, I, I don't know that parin is a sound that I would associate with breaking glass. But the thing that's interesting about this is with all of the English sound effects or the sounds that we get, there's also – What seems to be Japanese. I don't read Japanese. I don't know if McCarthy and Baker are just having fun at our expense. But this is very similar to a lot of manga that's translated into English where the sound effects become important and, in fact, they become a part of the art as well. So instead of translating that in the comic itself, what many manga translators will do is to include or just leave the Japanese sound effect in and maybe uh, in an appendix you'll have the translation of that. Or they could include the English along with the Japanese. So I, I think that McCarthy and Baker are taking a cue from manga in translation. But I don't know if this translation is accurate 
or if they're just playing around with uh, that, with that process that we've come to expect with manga. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of humor in this comic. Um, for instance, one of the characters is a street sweeper who's an elderly woman, and she's in some ways bemoaning the old ways when things were calmer and more quiet in her life. And for in a series of of sort of battle scenes and fight scenes or whatever, she ends up in the possession of the head of <laughs> of a robot that was designed to take over her job and be a street sweeper. And the two of them, she takes the head with her in her market basket. It's sort of sticking there, you know, and um, next to some carrots and lettuce. And they have this ongoing commentary about what's going on around them that's really pretty amusing. So there are these interludes of, of humor that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there is a lot of humor. And, and much of the humor is also based on, again, our expectations of manga, because many of the characters, especially some of the minor characters that we see, for instance, people in the streets or others uh, from a distance on the subway that we can see in a particular panel, they look like um, uh, you know various manga characters. So it could be it could be someone out of. Uh, uh, Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy. In fact, there's one character that very much looks like Astro Boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it just seems that uh, Baker is playing around here with, uh, uh, again, our expectation of what manga is like, not only in terms of the sound effects and characters, but also uh, with the action that's going mm -hmm. on. So uh, you know, one could see this as heavily influenced by shonen. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say is there's a lot of collage work going on here when you talk about how busy it is. There's also, I don't know if you noticed this, but some of the human characters look like characters out of um, maybe Tintin um, or some of the other sort of Franco-Belgian comics where there's a police inspector, for instance. He actually looks like a hard-boiled detective from 40s you know, comics or whatever. So there's a lot of different styles coinciding. Plus, in the background, there are watercolors of the city. So just on one image alone, you're, you're hit with maybe... 10 or 15 colors, different line styles, and then this overlay of collage. So, you know, on the one hand, that's what I think I mean when I said when I read it when I was tired, I had trouble following it. Mm -hmm. But the next morning when I was alert, I was able probably, re you know, with some caffeine from just coffee co-op, I, <laughs> <laughs> which really would be useful for this comic now that I think about it, um, I was able to follow it very well. So once you get used to the style um, and understand how it's operating, then then it's really enjoyable, and there really is a lot of humor. Um, I, I don't want to give too much away, but the softball game is very amusing, and mm -hmm. uh, I wish that we had uh, Sharon on the Detroit Tigers. There's a couple couple catches she might have made that would have been <laughs> helpful. So you know, it's, it, it also, I guess, we should say that there there are some Shakespearean overtones in the comic. Um, one of the the characters is Fortinbras, who is this this. Um, this Warrior old, robot. yeah, really an old school sort of attitude, and he he is sort of like the Fortinbras and Hamlet. He's impulsive. He he has good motives to a certain extent, but he's not going to stand around and brood about things. He really wants to mix it up, and you see the various ways in which he does this in this comic. And so there's some there's some. This is a comic that's extremely referential to a lot of other genres, I think, and it, it's just a lot of fun. I thought it was fun to read. It was. It was a lot of fun. And it, it's interesting. You mentioned the police inspectors, and that is uh, Seiko Udoku and Kato Tosin. And Kato Tosin is the assistant inspector, the hard-boiled looking guy that you'd mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I found it curious that when you saw those characters, you thought of Bandezone. When I looked at them, and especially the female uh, officer, Udoku, I thought of, again, Tezuka characters, mm -hmm. although you can look at the uh, her assistant inspector, Toshin, the, guy, the male, mm -hmm. and he, I guess, doesn't necessarily look manga-esque in, in – in, um, in, in his face, but but, but uh, you're right. There, there's a lot visually going on in this comic uh, in terms of the colors, in terms of the forms. 
Yeah, there's a great image. Now that you, the minute you were saying that, I was scrolling through the comic, and there's a great image of um, both of those characters in profile. And you're right. I mean, she has the very sort of pointy, ill defined no- nose and the huge eyes. The big whereas, moe eyes. Yeah, yeah, you know, whereas he is drawn in a very angular manner with a tiny little snoot. He looks like he could have walked right out of a fight with Tintin, honestly. It's pretty funny. Yeah. So, it, yeah, there's just so much going on stylistically here. Um, but out of that is a really interesting story. I mean, there, there is an ethical question behind this. Um, the comic does begin with human beings treating robots in a way that suggests that they're really scapegoated, um, that they, they really aren't the, the cause of all of society's troubles, but that's how people are choosing to view them. I also think there's an overtone here in terms of our current worldwide crisis involving refugees. And after all, most of the people who are in, um, in this Japanese um, sort of outpost are not Japanese, um, or at least a lot of them aren't. And so they're there as refugees, presumably. And so there's some interesting ethical story, ethical ideas going on behind what is a very humorous and stylistically adventurous comic. You know, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of the refugee issue as a potential, a potential subtext here. I guess because it's in the background, and you're right, we do get some exposition in this first issue that a lot of people are emigrating to Japan, which is no longer the Japan that we had once knew before you know, the, the big mm-hmm. conflict, uh, and, and that many people who are living there now aren't originally Japanese. And I'm hoping that McCarthy plays that out a little more in the issues to come. Uh, where we do, because right now we've primarily in the first two issues gotten a conflict between humans and robots, okay? And, right. and that's what this is all about. But it would be interesting to see if McCarthy is going to tease out more thoroughly any kind of conflict or any potential conflict between those who are native to Japan and those who have come there after this big war. Right. And also, um, I think it's, it's a comic that is considering how we use the objects in our life that are automated and whether or not we, we feel those should be personified. I, I, I don't know if I ever told you about my, my discussion with Siri once when I was driving in Chicago. You had a discussion with Siri. I did, and I was. Okay. She was. She was. I was hands free. Just, just to clarify that I try not to, to talk to Siri and drive simultaneously with the phone in my hand. So she was clipped up, and I was talking to her. But I was trying to get directions, and she had given me what I was looking for, and I thought she had shut down. Well, just then, some guy nearly like sideswipes me, and I had some colorful language that I sent in his direction, and from my phone comes Siri in this very serious voice. Gwen, watch your language. And it was this really weird moment where I was having this interaction with Siri, sort of like her, you know, the movie Her, but but it was really bizarre. And this comic was kind of reminding me of that a little way because these robots have um, very strong opinions and they're not afraid to share them. And many of their opinions are very humorous and dead on. So it was sort of like my conversation with Siri. Um, Watch my language. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Gwen, you know, you were mentioning the the robots and the way that they are, I guess we could call it humanized. In other words, we don't see them as the antagonist so much as uh, individuals or characters that we can empathize with to a large degree. Mm -hmm. Now, that leads me to what we discover at the end of issue one, and this is a character – who goes by the name of Sen. He introduces himself as Sen, but the older woman that you had mentioned, I think she addressed him as Sumimasen. But anyway, he is this older character. We don't know much about him, even after issue two, where he appears quite prominently. But he strikes me as being drawn as... I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong here. Kind of a, a stereotypical, almost a Fu Manchu kind of character. Yeah. He's a, he's an older Japanese male. He's got the, this long mustache, the thin mustache that hangs down, and he even has these long, sharp fingernails. If you if if you notice, mm-hmm. and so. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that disrupted from the narrative. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if this was a conscious decision on Baker's part, uh, maybe along with McCarthy, uh, to play around with certain stereotypes that we have. So I'm curious to see how this character Sen is used in the issues to come. 
Yeah, me too. And in a way, he's a counterpoint to the professor who has created um, Sheeran. So they, they both seem to have very strong ideologies that they're trying to put forward through robots. So it will be interesting to see if they end up having a, a conflict as well or a, a sort of a, a moment themselves where they sort of debate these issues. It will be interesting. Yeah. Now, one of the things I really enjoyed about this latest issue that's just come out or just about to come out, I guess, is, as we're recording this, is this, I guess, toy creature, um, Kuchikun, mm-hmm. that uh, <laughs> Siren is given a present by her friend Michiko of Kuchikun. Because in issue one, Michiko, who is very anti robot, learns the very beginning of the first issue that her friend Siren is a robot and so she doesn't want to have anything to do with her but she comes around and so by the time we get to issue number two Machiko says oh I'm okay with that I've thought about it and just to tell you I'm sorry for what I said before you know Machiko gives Siren a present and it is this little stuffed Kuchikun and then later in issue two we see these two girls, Siren and Machiko, at an elementary school, and they have this event where someone in a Kuchikun outfit comes out. <laughs> it, go- it goes horribly wrong. Yes. Uh, and it, it, you know, even, even although it's violent and there are young deaths, it's not um, represented in a tragic way. If anything, it's, it's quite comedic. Yes. It is. That's why I say that I, you know, on the one hand, there's some serious ethical questions that are being brought forward in reference to contemporary events that we're debating as a society. But in other ways, the way the comic is drawn and the way that things are presented, I I think we're supposed to, to recognize those threads, but I'm not sure how seriously we're meant to take them. Right. And and this gets to another issue I wanted to raise with Circuit Breaker, and that is, especially as it deals with this title's humor, how much of this is written in by McCarthy, and then how much of it is illustrated through Baker? Um, Are are you familiar with Kyle Baker's other works? I know he did um, Plastic Man. Am I right about that? Right. Yeah, but I the most I, recent, yeah, yeah, longer run, yeah. But he's been he's been drawing for quite some time, right? Yeah, he has. Now, I mean, he's done really serious things, such as Nat Turner. Uh, but whenever I think of of Kyle Baker, I think of his humor comics, and and he he has comics that he does about his family that are like gag strips. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's called uh, the Baker Family or the Bakers. I can't remember. It's been a while since I've uh, read that collection or one of the collections. But some of the other books that he did early in his career, I absolutely love, and they're hilarious. Uh, the Cowboy Wally Show that even sounds funny, and it is funny. <laughs> uh, but there is why I hate Saturn. And you are here, but he's done a variety of other things. Uh, you're right; he did uh, Plastic Man. If did you read the book from a few years back, The Fifth Beetle, about Brian Epstein? No, but I'm okay. going to now. Anymore. Yeah, he did. He did a small section, just several pages in that, um, and he he did the part where the Beatles were in the Philippines and the weird things that happened. And I think that it was. Kyle Baker's style of art that could could best bring out the strangeness of that Philippine experience early, fairly early in the Beatles' career, or I guess mid-career at that point, um, where things seemed to just go wrong. They thought that they were uh, going to be imprisoned, or or you know who who knows. Uh, and Kyle Baker illustrates that brief segment in the narrative. But again, it's utilizing his his comedy the way that he draws things. Again, he can get really serious, as we can see in in Nat Turner. But given that Baker is the illustrator of this comic, I really wonder if much of the humor is coming out through the illustration and not necessarily in the script. Mm, that's a really good point. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, just seeing a cute, cuddly cartoon character put <laughs> a bomb in his mouth and have it go off, is is it was... I mean, I hate to say it, you feel guilty about laughing, but it was just hysterical. Yeah, or to um, pull knives out of his mouth. Yeah, I mean, it's just because I guess the conceit we should tell tell our listeners is that in in a children's program, he pulls out all sorts of fun toys and things. And so the <laughs> idea that he's basically, you know, doing that same thing in an elementary school, but is then blowing it up um, and and being quite violent is... I mean, it's you feel guilty about laughing, but it's really visually pretty funny the way it's handled. So, 
Exactly. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's something that I would like to continue with. Now, I don't know if this is going to be a limited series or if it, for now at least, is going to be ongoing. Uh, but we do have two issues out. Uh, the second one, I think, just comes out this week. Right. Well, Gwen, before we get to the last title, let's remind our listeners that if they want some good coffee, tea, or chocolate, they would do well to go to the website of one of our sponsors for this episode, and that is Just Coffee Co-op. If you go to justcoffee.coop, that's just coffee, one word, dot C-O-O-P, you'll find a variety of coffees, teas, and chocolates. And, and plus, you can feel good about ordering this stuff because it's fair trade, it's organic, and this is a cooperative. So the people who work for this company are owners of the company. If you use our coupon code COMICS, you'll get 10% off of your order. So you help us, you help yourself with good coffee, tea, and chocolate, and you help the good folks at this cooperative, Just Coffee Co-op. Now let's turn to the third title, which is Matt Kent and Charlene Kent's Department H, number one. Or I guess you could call it, as you did at the top of the show, Depth. That's right. And I now totally see that. But again, this is called early morning. And (laughs) we were we are finding out that I'm not always so awake. But this is really an exciting comic, Derek. I, um, I don't know about you. But when I was growing up, I really loved the mystery genre. I still read it today. And that's what this comic really is. It's a mystery. And it starts out that way. And um, this first um, issue really is introducing us to the main players and getting us. It's a who done it, but it's a who done it that is in a very interesting environment. Exactly, um, it's a who done it that takes place primarily underwater. I mean, when we get to the very beginning of this first issue, we're introduced to Mia Hardy. Uh, and she is the daughter of uh, a scientist named Harry Hardy, H-A-R-I. And we learn early on that her father has been murdered. Uh, and he uh, – there is this underwater research facility, very, very deep underwater, and it's called Usear, U-S-E-A-R, uh, the, the organization that they work for, Underwater Science Exploration and Research. And – you know, I think a good bit of exposition comes in these opening pages as Mia is going down to that facility deep underwater. But it's not exposition in a heavy-handed way that has you roll in your eyes. Mm-hmm. I think it's necessary. Uh, in the first several pages, as Mia is meeting with people who are a part of uh, Usir, they're telling her she doesn't have to do this. You know, They recommend that she don't, and what they're recommending that she doesn't do is to go find the murderer or to solve the mystery of her father's murder. Uh, but as she is being taken in a, an underwater vehicle deep down into the depths by a security officer, this big hulking guy by the name of Q – then we get the exposition, and when Kent – well, I guess both Kents, uh, Matt Kent and Charlene. We should mention that Matt does the writing and art, but Charlene does the colors, and I think it's the colors in Department H, number one, that, that, that really stand out. Because when Mia is giving us some background information, it's a lack of color. So it's um, – oh, what is it? It's more of a sepia. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I guess tone that we know that we're in the past that Mia is telling us some background information that we need to know in order to appreciate what the situation is the death of her father and her going down to find out who the murderer actually was and so she goes down into this underwater facility finds her father and that's basically all we have in this first issue. And even though it doesn't seem like much has happened, I mean, in essence, in terms of the action, is she is above ground, goes underwater, goes to this undersea facility, and sees her father. 
and is ready to begin her investigation. And so not much happens, but there is a lot of action, a lot of action through backstory, through dialogue, through memory. And I think we have a really strong first issue that sets the stage for this series to come. Yeah, you know, when I was young, one of my favorite series was the Ellery Queen Mysteries. Oh, yeah. Did you like those? Oh, um, on TV or the books? Both. I mean, I loved the books, but I loved the TV show with Jim Hutton as Ellery Queen. Oh, yeah. I loved uh, the TV show as a kid. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but um, in promos for the series and oftentimes in um, at the very beginning, there would be um, this sort of panorama of all of the characters you were going to meet in the episode. And you would get a little backstory for each of them. And what I found really charming was at the end of this comic, the very last page, all of the characters whom you've met who are in this under see facility, you see them with a tiny little um, description of who they are and what relationship they have to Mia. And I found that not only to be handy as a reference, but it just it just evoked that um, that whodunit atmosphere where you have, here are all the characters. They're like a game of Clue or something like that. These are the yeah. characters. Ostensibly one of them is the murderer. Mia is trapped under, not trapped, but she is underground with them. I mean underwater so far deep. I don't know, Derek. I thought that not only was the use of color good in evoking mood, but in evoking claustrophobia. Mm-hmm. Um, I really felt that I was um, – I felt trapped <laughs> because I'm claustrophobic. But it was a good kind of feeling because I love mysteries and I love that sense of she's sort of there with them. Something is going to happen. You know it's going to be super dramatic. There's going to be a lot of revelation. And I don't know. It just sets the stage for an exciting mystery. Yeah, and I'm glad you pointed out that that last panel, which is actually a full page of this comic, um, you know, Mia has gotten to the facility, gone to where the part of the facility that was flooded that resulted in her father's death. She investigates that briefly, comes back in, and as she's coming back into the main facility, we get this – this is what you were referencing, this full page of all the characters down there and a little bit of information about them, their names and their relationships to Mia. And they're all looking at her, right? So it's like she's coming back in and all of these characters are looking right at her. And this is when we're really introduced to these people. So, I mean, we see again Q and he's called – in fact – I didn't notice this at first, but this information is presented almost like word bubbles Mm -hmm. because there's a a little trail that it's almost as if they're speaking that – so the character Q – it's, a, it's almost as if he is saying, head of security, the muscle. But then there are a lot of other characters, too. There's her brother, Raj. And the information there is, my brother, and more like a father than he'll ever admit. And then there is Lily, my childhood friend. We've had a falling out. And then a character that she meant when she first got down there, Aaron, research assistant, and chaplain. Because he he, he <laughs> takes over being chaplain, even though he has no training. In theology, I guess. Uh, So it's kind of strange. But again, we're talking about Matt Kent here, so I think strange goes hand in hand with the story that we're being told. Well, you know, and I'm assuming, you know, in the notes at the end of the comic, he actually has a relatively long author note that says one of his major influences was Moby Dick. And in a way, if you look at this crew um, in that panel that you're talking about, and you think about Q maybe as... You know, quick quack. I don't know. You know, he even I mean, has tattoos. Yeah, I mean, it's just there's a there's a way in which you sort of say, "Wow, this is going to be an interesting voyage." Um, <laughs> you know, and the, I love any text that pair that that has reference to Moby Dick. So, um, because when you read that book and you read it all the, the way through and you read every word of it, you want to be using that for the rest of your dang life. So. <laughs> Oh, that's right. <laughs> Anytime you could make a reference like that, it's good. So You know, I'm glad that you mentioned the afterword at the end of this first issue because I, I think there's a lot to, to discuss here, and it tells us what kind of story we're – uh, we're, we're in in store for now. He does mention this reference to Moby Dick, and he's trying to describe what he wants to do with Department H. And this is the way that he describes it. He says it was inspired by a lot of things, such as the 1970s GI Joe, the Fisher Price Adventure People toy line, Tintin, <laughs> Agatha Christie, Raymond Chandler, Moby Dick, Two Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, Sherlock Holmes, Jacques Cousteau, and a healthy fear of drowning. I mean, all of that is packed in here, and, and you can definitely see that just in this first issue. <laughs> But what I find even more interesting about this afterward, where 
uh, Kent is telling us what to expect in kind of a loose way. He's also inviting readers to send in letters, and he even says, come up with a name for the letter section, and he challenges readers to do that. But he says that this should be read in single issues. So he says, I intend to reward you. Every monthly issue is going to have content you won't find in the collections, art, stories, process insights, a lot of stuff. Everything you find in the inside covers and back covers is going to be unique to the monthly experience. Every issue of the series is one day in the life of our main character. Reading that month by month is going to change your perception of the events. Every detail will be more important. Every line will have a little more meaning. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is, um, are are you familiar with his previous series from Dark Horse? And I don't know if we mentioned this at the top of the show, but Department H is a Dark Horse title. But Mind Management, did you read that? No. No. Okay, mind management, this reminds me quite a bit of mind management in that there is quite a bit of intrigue going on here. Mm -hmm. But also with mind management, it's one of those series that, yeah, you could read in the collected volumes, and that's all been collected. But you really miss out in not reading it in single issues because just as we can expect what Ken tells us here – from Department H, we also had with Mind Management. There are a lot of things in the single issues of Mind Management you didn't get in the collections. Uh, a lot of extras. And in fact, I remember with the first narrative arc of Mind Management, the back covers, if you assembled them, they created a larger image. Oh, wow. Uh, so little things like that. And I really appreciate what Kent does with his comics in general, in that he tells a good story, but there is also. I guess you could possibly call it paratext uh, that goes on at the same time. Uh, you know, sometimes people may see them as Easter eggs, little bits of information, ways of reading the story with the, I think, the ancillary things that go on around it. Uh, so, for instance, with mind management, one of the things that you had in addition to the story proper, and especially in the single issues, are little messages that were on the edges of some of the pages mm. that also added to the story. And if I look at the pages of depth, or I guess uh, Department H, number one, the way that it looks, it looks... Uh, how would you describe these pages? Because on one edge of some of these pages, mm-hmm. there's like a, it's almost like notebook paper or a certain kind of ruled. Well, paper. and you know, we see in the um, in the in the lab of Mia's father all of these journals, these bound journals, Journal Eight, Journal Nine, and um, then we see these these pages that look like they've been either put in a notebook or ripped out of a notebook. I don't know. Yeah, it's really yeah. so you get the sense that. Um, you know, it, it just sort of is a nice, uh, a nice gesture to that. Right. So e- even the very layout of the page uh, can become an important part of the story. Mm-hmm. But because for all we know, we're now reading parts of the journals or something journal-like that Mia has discovered at the murder scene. Yeah, I mean, it's just there's a. I get the sense there's a lot of. Um, let me put it this way: I put this comic on my pull list because it good. drew me in right away. And I, like I said, I love a good mystery, and this one is setting it up very nicely. There's a lot of artifacts that Mia finds at the crime scene that we don't know their significance now, but I'm sure that they're all going to have significance later because they've all been carefully labeled, such as a, a beaker that says, you know, danger, explosive material, etc. So I, I'm excited to put the clues together. I really am. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm glad to see this. Uh, his Matt Kent's, I guess, most recent series with Dark Horse, and that was Passed it didn't last as long as I thought it was going to last, and I have no idea if it ended when it was supposed to originally uh, planned or if there just wasn't that enough of a reaction for him to sustain that. Um, but part of this reminds me of Passaways. A lot of it reminds me of Mind Management, as I mentioned. But a lot of this also reminds me of a book that came out a few years ago uh, by First Second, and that was Red Handed, The Fine Art of Strange Crimes. Did you read that? No. But I'm going oh. to now. <laughs> okay. I know you love First Second. I and do. I know now that you love Matt Kent. 
you absolutely have to read Red Handed, The Fine right. Art of Strange Crimes. Okay. Uh, we, we reviewed that, I think, within the first year of doing the podcast, and it was both my and Kunkka's favorite of that year. I guess it was 2013. Uh, an outstanding book, and it has a lot to do with some of the same issues. It's, it's a murder mystery, but Red Handed is a little more self-conscious. But for all we know, Department H could become much more metafictional as the series continues. Yeah. Oh, wow. Exciting. This is really great. Yeah. And this is not, from what I can gather, a limited series because Kent does say in the afterword something about two years from now, we may be at a certain place. So this is something that he has every intention of continuing as he did mind management. Mm -hmm. And he says there is an ending which I really appreciate. In other words, it's not going to be something that is going to be dropped or that we won't know what happens in the end. And so as someone who really loves mysteries, I also have someone who likes endings. I like to know that there's going to be a payoff if I work really hard as a detective. So it's mm -hmm. great. Well, Gwen, we looked at three great titles for this week. We started off with Manuel Fiore's 5,000 kilometers per second. After that, we looked at the first two issues of Circuit Breaker, written by Kevin McCarthy with art by Kyle Baker. Then we looked at a phenomenal first issue by the merry team of Matt and Charlene Kent, Department H, or you can call it Depth, I guess. Yeah, these were really great books, Derek. And, uh, you know, now that I think about it, we've been talking about them for a while. One thing that they do share in common is a really sophisticated use of color. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you love colorful comics or comics where a lot of the narrative is driven by, among other things, color, I think you'll really love these books. You know, you're right. Uh, this has been a rather colorful episode. <laughs> That's right. Siri would agree. Language, Gwen and Derek. Language. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if um, you want to find great comics like this, then definitely head over to the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, as Gwen said at the top of the show, you'll find great discounts on these titles and a variety of others. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about this week's discussion. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll see that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe. It's really simple and easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. You can also contact us by email at twoguys at comicsalternative.com, or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm at Gwen at comicsalternative.com. Derek, how can people reach you? And if you want to get in touch with me directly and tell me that you're a little uneasy about Gwen's conversation with uh, Siri, <laughs> uh, you can reach me at Derek at comicsalternative.com. <laughs> Um, you can also find us on Twitter, where we announce new content to our podcast and updates to our blog. And there we are at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn. And you can now find us on Spotify as well. But as always, you can get every single one of our podcast episodes as well as read the various reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. Right. Well, Derek, this has been a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to talking more comics with you soon. Same here. Uh, and until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.